82, a comprehensive final chapter in the story of Hurricane Cleo as it was recorded for the people of South Florida by WCKT News. Lauderdale's new tunnel avoided a similar tie-up in that city. It had revived an often-discussed plan in Miami to replace bridges with tunnels. The late warning also caused a stampede to local lumber yards. There has been some talk about complacency on the part of Miamians in preparing for Hurricane Cleo. However, the boarding up procedure can be expensive. Storm-wise Floridians have learned to depend on official advisories before swinging into action. It was a fractional change in Cleo's steering currents that brought the storm to the South Florida coast when weathermen thought she would pass safely offshore. By the time the storm watchers decided that the changes they observed were more than temporary deviations, there was not much time left. As late afternoon approached and Cleo's fringe winds began lashing the palm trees, Local food stores were still jammed with customers loading up on canned goods, candles, and sterno for the expected power failures. At Homestead Air Force Base, evacuation of jet bombers and fighters got underway. Army missile men left stations in the Everglades for higher ground in Homestead, and about the same time, civil defense officials ordered the evacuation of Key Biscayne. As evening approached, gale winds whipped across Biscayne Bay, and a light rain fell sporadically. Power was knocked out throughout the county, including Miami Beach. The fallen wires, a hazard to newsmen, police, and emergency crews, sparked everywhere, causing a number of fires. During the height of the storm, beach firemen were called out to fight a transformer blaze. They had to fight the flames as well as the wind, which kept blowing water from their hoses back into their face. Hurricane Cleo, a small but compact storm, did not cause the widespread destruction brought by other storms in Florida's history. In particular, there were no tidal waves that usually accompany a severe hurricane and threaten oceanfront areas. But Cleo delivered a direct hit on Miami Beach, and her winds whipped past 115 miles an hour. It was more than enough to do considerable damage to the resort city. with Cleo, Cleo's fury, others just gave up. A lifeguard stand blown 200 yards from the sandy beach. Hotel owners estimate that their sign damage was almost as much as their broken glass damage. Estimates range as high as $500,000. As for most of the damage to cars and homes, anything that wasn't firmly tied down was an easy victim of Cleo's deadly gusts. Tides during the storm rose only two feet above normal, but it was enough to bring the wind-whipped waves washing over the causeways connecting Miami Beach with the mainland. Miami mainland, Cleo dealt a heavy blow to business property, blowing out many storefronts and destroying countless thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. The storm dealt its heaviest blow to the beach areas in the northern half of Dade County. The low-lying South Dade suburbs, badly hit by Hurricane Donna four years ago, came away comparatively unscratched. The Red Cross counted 1,200 homes damaged throughout Dade County, most of them in Miami and Coral Gables. Some 13 trailers were reported demolished and another 77 badly damaged. Perhaps the greatest problem caused by Hurricane Cleo was the loss of electric power. More than 300,000 homes were blackened at the height of the storm, with many thousands without power for over a week. Communications also suffered, with more than 61,000 telephones out of service. Happily summed it up when he joined...
Judge Cleo the worst storm to strike that city in 36 years. Fort Lauderdale was equally hard hit, with civil defense officials tagging the damage at $36 million. As in Dade County, trees fell like 10 pins, causing damage of their own to homes, automobiles, and to power lines.